What's up everybody, Dr. Rossi, shrinksandsneakers.com. I've been doing a series where I'm covering the most commonly prescribed medications. And when I looked at the list of these most commonly prescribed medications for psychiatric or mental health purposes, I was not surprised at all to see this medication on the list. And that's because this is commonly prescribed for multiple reasons, and we'll get into exactly why those things are. So the medication we're covering today is Trazodone. And I'm going to explain a little bit about the mechanism. I'm going to talk about some of the uses of this medication, as well as how to dose it, and what are some of the potential side effects as well to using this medication. So trazodone is only FDA approved for depression, specifically for the treatment of depression. However, this medication is rarely prescribed for that purpose. Basically, most people have trouble staying on the medication at the doses required to treat depression. And that's because of some of the side effect profiles, specifically sedation, that's associated with taking the medication during the day. So a lot of the cases, the most common way you see this medication used is as an adjunctive therapy for sleep disturbances in major depressive disorder, or as a primary a treatment for primary insomnia. So it can also be used uh, to help with sleep for primary insomnia. A few of the other uses that I think people are not really aware of, but there are ways that I like to use this medication occasionally, depending on my patient and depending on the circumstances. So I will actually use this medication for people with PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, related sleep disturbance and nightmares. Although it's not the same as Prozosin, which is a medication that specifically targets the nightmares and has, has had some pretty good studies from the... Um, from the VA, it still has a lot of benefits and I've had good success clinically with the treatment of PTSD related sleep disturbances as well as nightmares. So that's one additional way that you can use this outside of depression and primary insomnia. The other areas to talk about here is definitely primary insomnia because although it's not FDA approved for that reason, it does seem to help. And how does it help? It increases total sleep time by 30 to 50 minutes and it also increases that deep or slower wave sleep that we see in stages two and three, or what we call non-REM stage two and non-REM stage three. So increases deep sleep, increases total sleep time, and can be used to treat primary insomnia. Now this is the preferred hypnotic for a patient with sleep apnea. So if you've ever treated a sleep disturbance in a patient with sleep apnea, you have to be really careful. A lot of the things like the Z drugs or the benzodiazepines are off the table for these patients. So you have to use something that's a, that's a sedating antidepressant usually, namely mirtazapine or trazodone. So trazodone has a nice, uh, it fits nicely here for people with sleep apnea. You want to avoid this medication in any patients that have a diagnosis of sickle cell anemia. You want to also avoid it in leukemia, any type of hypercoagulable states. And you also want to, which this is maybe not something most people are aware of, but you also want to avoid this medication in people who are using cocaine or methamphetamine, so stimulant-based drugs. The mechanism of action is slightly different than what you might see in other antidepressants. So primarily, it's actually blockade of serotonin 2A receptors. So it's going to block these serotonin 2A receptors, which isn't that much different than other antidepressant medications but most of the other ones we talk about are usually serotonin reuptake inhibitors, so they're blocking the serotonin reuptake pump. Not necessarily, and this does do that too, but to a lesser degree than what you would see with other antidepressant medications. So that's one of the big differences. It's primarily 5-HT2A blockade, but also has serotonin reuptake pump blockade as well. So it works by both mechanisms, but lower affinity for the serotonin reuptake pump. Now the dosing of this medication, a lot of times it depends on what we're treating and that will dictate how we dose the medication. So to take advantage of the sedating properties of the medication, let's say I want to use it for primary insomnia, I want to use it for sleep related disturbances and depression, I'll dose it anywhere from 25 to 150 milligrams per night. And I will usually keep it low. And the lower the better, because again, that takes advantage of those side effect profile, which is what we're trying to do when we're trying to get those sedating effects. So for depression though, the patient will have to take a much higher dose, and this is why people have trouble taking this as, an, as a primary antidepressant, because the dose is going to be anywhere from 150 
to 600 milligrams a day. So this is kind of a wide range, and of course you gotta titrate up, and you're gonna break it down into multiple divided doses. So if I'm dosing this for depression, you wanna usually start with 150 milligrams per day in divided doses, and that's because it has a short half-life. So with a short half-life, we need to do multiple days of dosing, multiple times per day of dosing, which is different. And that's why I talk about the use of extended release and things of that nature. So short half-life medications require multiple times per day, require you take it multiple times per day. And you can increase this dose every three or four days by 50 milligrams per day. So every three to four days, you can titrate up to 50 milligrams as needed. And you want to tar target a dose of approximately 400 milligrams per day if you're treating depression. Again, for insomnia, it's much lower. You might be able to get away with 25 to 50 milligrams at night and then a target dose of 50 to 100 milligrams per night for insomnia or sleep disturbances related to depression. Again, not using it as a primary antidepressant. It's very important to start low with this medication and go slow. That is the motto we use often in psychiatry, start low and go slow. It helps us to avoid side effects. And one of the big side effects that with this is that people can have increased feelings of sedation. So we want to start low and we don't want them to feel overly sedated and we don't want carryover sedation, ataxia, or intoxicated like feelings when the patient wakes up in the morning if we go too fast. So what we find is if you titrate this medication too fast, you run into those kind of problems. You also don't want to stop this medication prematurely, uh, often for difficult to treat patients, and if you're using this again as your primary antidepressant medication, you need a much higher dose, probably somewhere between 150 and 300 milligrams, but in some cases all the way up to 600 milligrams or even 800 milligrams depending on the circumstances. So it really will depend on the clinical picture with the patient, but this is an important point not to stop too early. It's ideal to dose this at night, again, before bed, because of the, the, the risk of daytime sedation. So if you can take the dose at night for sleep, again, that 25 to 150 milligram dose, somewhere in that range, it's going to be ideal to do that before bedtime to avoid the daytime sedation. Some of the notable side effects I want to talk about, because this is important, and this actually has a better side effect profile than some of the other antidepressants we've talked about in the past. So notable side effects, nausea, vomiting, constipation, dry mouth, dizziness, of course sedation and fatigue, headaches, and the one that really comes up with this, and they used to, in medical school, they used to have uh, trazabone, and that was because of its propensity to cause something called priapism, which is a painful erection lasting two to four hours. So if somebody is to have this side effect of priapism, it's a life-threatening emergency and they need to go to the emergency department immediately. So you want to look out for that. And that occurs roughly in 1 to 6,000 to 1 to 8,000 men. And it depends on what study you read. There's some differences there of opinion on the actual numbers. But somewhere around 1 to 8,000 men, let's say, will experience this potential side effect. Other life-threatening side effects include seizures and possibly in patients under the age of 24, the activation of suicidal ideation. And that's a point we should really definitely talk about because people often misunderstand what that means. So maybe a future topic in a video if people are interested. Obviously significant sedation is possible and weight gain of course comes along with sedation. If you're not moving and you're too tired all the time, you're simply going to gain weight. So we wanna watch out for weight gain with this medication as well. The onset of therapeutic actions for insomnia actually are immediate. So this is really nice. This is one benefit. Normally with antidepressants, we have to wait, you know, four weeks, six weeks to start to see the full effect. With this medication, when you're talking about insomnia, it is immediate. You're going to have benefits right away as long as you're taking an adequate dose. There's also another very important point about this because, like I said, a lot of the medications we use for sleep are things like benzodiazepines or Z drugs. There's no evidence for tolerance, abuse potential, or withdrawal with trazodone. So no addictive potential of use it for using this medication. So there's no addiction risk when you're prescribing trazodone. Another reason it makes it a great hypnotic. Now, the therapeutic action, of course, of the antidepressant effects is delayed by about two to four weeks. And if it's not working by six to eight weeks, you want to consider 
a dosage increase or switching depending on the circumstances. So to wrap this video, what I'll say is I actually like trazodone as a medication. The place that I trained at actually saw it being so good that they actually keep it as a PRN medication for patients who come to the inpatient unit. It's available to help with sleep. So trazodone offers a non-addictive option for insomnia treatment. It can be used as an adjunct treatment to depression or for a primary treatment of depression. It can also be used to treat the PTSD nightmares and sleep disturbances created by PTSD. It can also be used for primary insomnia in patients who are dealing with that disorder. It's less likely than other antidepressants to cause sexual dysfunction, and it's less likely to precipitate hypomania if you were to give this medication to somebody with a diagnosis of bipolar disorder. There is also some evidence to suggest it may help with patients who have dementia, who come into the hospital and possibly become delirious, and this can help with treating agitation and aggression in those patients with dementia. So there's some evidence to support that in the literature as well. And the other benefit, like I already kind of alluded to, was this is there's no evidence for tolerance, abuse, or withdrawal, so it does, it's a non-addictive option to help people sleep. Trazodone is also a good option, which this is not really known, for people who have failed two prior antidepressants. So someone who might be, quote, treatment resistant or, good, or leaning towards the spectrum of treatment resistant depression, trazodone actually might be a good option to try in that patient if they don't want to try medications like tricyclic antidepressants or MAOI inhibitors, which can be a little bit more difficult from a side effect profile and a little more dangerous for patients with cardiac disease and or who are elderly. With that said, I'm going to wrap the video there. If you guys have questions about trazodone, drop them below in the comments section. And please like and subscribe to the channel so that we can continue making videos just like this.